many times have we heard that, you know, when we, when we preach on hell or mention hell and talk about it, it's for eternity, it's everlasting punishment, and someone will use the say, or several, and maybe you've even thought it, and that's a little bit extreme that, you know, the punishment fit in the crime, that's something's wrong there. And, uh, but when we think about what Jesus, the Son of God, went through for us on the cross, how he left the glory of heaven, I mean, you know, and chose to come to this old world and take on a body of flesh and begin his earthly walk going to that cross, and nothing, my friends, nothing could deter him, nothing could uh, persuade him to go otherwise, nothing could hinder him. The Old Testament prophet says he will set his face as a flint toward Jerusalem, and when he started, he would not stop. Even Satan himself tried to get, use Peter to stop him from doing that. And what did he say to Peter? Get behind me, Satan. Uh, but that's because of the love that he had for us, for you, for me, for all the world. And, uh, you know, he had that love. And so when you think about all that he did for, and, and the brutality he went to, through, and when you think about the suffering that he went through and how horrible it was, the beating, the, the whole passion of the cross, my friends, I mean, you know, and, and again, it was all because of the love of Christ for us. All right, now let's open our Bibles to the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 16. And I might add, even up to this point in the period of the Great Tribulation, God is still, still extending his mercy to a lost and dying world. He is still through the 144,000, through the previous two witnesses, and uh, even a, a, an angel preaching to heaven preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the gospel is this, that God loves you so much that he sent his only begotten son unto the world to die for you, to take your place on Calvary, take on the body of flesh, and to suffer all that beating, all that cruelty. And he shed his life's blood, and he became your sacrifice, your substitute. He bore the penalty for your sins. That's how much God loves us. And even during these dark, terrible days in the tribulation, God is still up until Revelation chapter 16, uh, which we'll talk about the bold judgments in a little bit, God has still been trying to reach out to a lost and dying world. And that's how merciful God is, how much grace that he has for you and me. But let me ask you a question to start this off with. Have you ever thought about how bad and how awful this period is going to be? How bad and how awful, how horrendous the great tribulation is going to be? Especially as you read the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, he said this. You don't have to turn now, just listen to it. He says, it's going to be great tribulation as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And he goes on to say, unless those days be shortened, no flesh would survive. And he's just, of course, echoing the words of the prophet Daniel in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, where it's going to, he says it's going to be a terrible time for the people of Israel. No time ever, even before that, ever been as bad as what they've been through. And when you think about it, you read the Old Testament, and you read the history of Israel, and you see what the Jews have been through, the Hebrews have been through, the suffering, I mean, the torment, the, uh, the torture, and the, the killings, and all of this that they went through, even those periods of time the hatred and all that and Daniel says listen the tribulation is going to come those days are coming and it's not whatever they've been through in the, in the periods before is not going to even compare to it and Jesus said we just read it he says no ever shall ever be even in time to come is going to be comparing with that so that is saying a whole lot in it when you think about what the Jewish people have been through when you again when you read the history of the Jewish race and and know of the the anti-Semitism, the pure out hatred that the world has had for them, and the mass slaughters that they've been through. We think about the Holocaust. How many was it killed during the Holocaust? Six million, I believe it was. And then nothing is going to compare to what they're going through yet in the Great Tribulation. So it's saying a whole lot, isn't it? It's going to be a terrible time. Now, when we get to chapter 16, you've got to understand what they've already been through. And not only the Jews, but I'm talking about Gentiles too. I'm talking about those left behind after the rapture of the church. I'm talking about their population of the whole world, what they've already went through. 
Now remember, hold your place in 16. Go back to chapter 6. And you'll see that they've already been through a series of judgments, beginning with the seal judgments. First, of course, the first seal judgment is peace, Cold War peace. Probably this is where the Antichrist comes in, and he deceives the whole world, and he deceives them by uh, saying that he's the man with the plan, and all the world's going to follow after him. We read later in the book of Revelation. Why? Because he brings in a worldwide peace. I think the tribulation begins with a covenant agreement signed by the Jews and the Arab nations as well. And they follow the Antichrist in this. So there is a period of peace for a short period of time. But remember what the uh, prophet says. When they say peace, peace, what? Then cometh sudden destruction. So it doesn't last long. And you follow these, these sealed judgments, you'll see that there's open warfare, verses 3 and 4. You'll see in verses 5 and 6, famine, starvation, all this is going to happen as a result of the wars that takes place upon the planet during this time. And remember, this is just the beginning of the tribulation. The fourth seal, wholesale death. The Bible tells us that many are going to be dying in that, year, in that period of time. The Bible tells us in verse 8, for example, in chapter 6, uh, I looked, behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was death and hell followed unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill them with sword and with hunger, with death and with the beast of the earth. At, because of these series of judgments, and especially on this fourth seal judgment, a quarter of the population of the world is going to die during this time either from war, from disease, from decay, from starvation, famine, whatever. But that's approximately, at this time, uh, maybe around 100, 750 million people is going to die at this time. Then we get to the fifth seal, and we see martyrdom, those who are dying for their faith for the, in the Lord Jesus Christ. The sixth seal, physical disturbance, and someone said, and I read this years ago, and I read a lot about it here lately as well, this could be describing a nuclear Holocaust, and when you look at it, it seems to, uh, uh, you know, seem to look that way. I beheld it open the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. The stars of heaven fell into the earth, even as a fig tree cast of her untimely figs, and when she is shaken of a mighty wind, and the heaven departed as a scroll. Now, if you've ever seen the pictures of an atomic nuclear blast. You can see the heavens, in a sense, the sky receding. It looks like it's peeling away. And so this looks, it could be something close to this. But it goes on to say that every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And it goes on to say that the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the chief captains, the mighty men, every bondman, every free man. Look at this. It's so bad that they're hiding themselves in the dens and the rocks of the mountains. And they're saying this, fall on us, fall on us, hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. And at least at this point, they are acknowledging that these judgments are from Almighty God, the creator of heavens and earth. But do, the, do you see any kind of widespread repentance at this point? No, you do not. You see the opposite, as we'll see in a few minutes. But that's the seal judgments. You go with chapter 8, and a, a series, another series of judgments takes place. This is called as trumpet judgments. And you start reading through this, and you'll see that so many of these judgments, again, that so many are affected on the planet. First judgment uh, is the first trumpet judgment. You find that in verse 7, the first angel sounded. There followed hell and fire mingled with blood. They were cast to the earth. And notice this, take note of this, because you'll see a comparison. Uh, we'll see a contrast between this and the, and the judgments we're going to look at in a few minutes. But it says that the third part of the trees was burnt up. All green grass was burnt up. Second trumpet, sea smitten. Second angel sounded, and there was a great mountain burning. Some have said this could be something like a nuclear holocaust or atomic bomb or something like this. Fire was cast into the sea. A third part, notice a third part of the sea became blood. Third part of the creatures which were in the sea that had life, they died, and the third part of the ships were destroyed. Next trumpet judgment, the, uh, the uh, drinking waters, the fountains, the uh, uh, water is smitten. And uh, the third angel sent, and fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp. You see all of these judgments that are taking place, one after another. Mankind, humankind, the men and the women upon the planet during this time, they just won't even be able to take a deep breath. It'll be one judgment after another. It'll be that quick in rapid succession. But none of these, my friends, is bad as what they're going to face in the bold judgments. 
The Bible says in verse 12 of chapter 8, The fourth angel said the third part of the sun was smitten. And the reason I'm doing this, again, is I'm contrasting this with these judgments we're going to look at in a few minutes. Third part of the moon, third part of the stars, third part of them was darkened, and a third part of the sun, uh, the day did not shine, uh, a third part of it, like the night likewise. And he goes on to say just how bad. And then you get to chapter 9, and you see the fifth trumpet judgment. And, and as a result of this, there's going to be a demonic invasion upon earth. Demons are going to be let loose out of the abyss. We would say probably the pit of hell is going to be open during this time. And some would look at this and read this. And because of the movies that they have read and the novels that they, I mean movies they have seen and novels they have read. They would say something like, this is, man, this is fairy tale stuff. None of this stuff is going to happen. I remember I was preaching on this many years ago. And, and one, someone made some kind of sarcastic remark and said something like this. Wonder what John was smoking when he wrote these things down. That's how bad. I mean, folks, but listen, it's no fairy tale. It's no myth. It's not a movie. It's not a novel. And certainly John was not on there. His eyes was open and he saw all of these things into the future. And what he writes here, my friends, is literally going to happen. It's going to take place. And it's going to be so bad in that day. The Bible tells us, and in, in going on as we read this, that men are going to seek death. They're going, to, they're going to want to die, it says in verse 6 of chapter 9. Those days shall men seek death and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. Because of all the judgments they've been through, because of the havoc upon the planet, because of the wars, because of the famines, because of the diseases associated with that. And then at this time, demonic creatures, I mean, tormenting them for a period of five months. And they're going to want to die. They're going to seek death, and they're not going to be able to find it. God says, no, you've got some more things you're going to go through. And we would look at that and we say, there's no way possible. I heard uh, or I read where Dr. You remember Oliver Green, great preacher years ago. He says, now I don't know how to understand this in the sense he was saying that. He says, but I can see men trying to hang themselves and it just won't work. The ropes will break. I can see men trying to take a knife and cut their throat. Of the it's not going to work. Why? Because God says, no, death will flee from them. All part of these judgments. Then it goes on to say about the sixth trump, trumpet judgment. Beginning in verse 13 of chapter 9. It says that, and again, this is preparing for the great battle, the great battle of Armageddon. The Bible says the four angels were loosed and they were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year to afford to slay the third part of men. The number of the army, the horsemen that was is coming from the east, the far east, 200,000 thousand, which means 200 million men army. Thus I saw the horses in the vision of them that sat on them. He goes on to give a description there, but verse 18 says this. By these three was the third part of men killed by the fire and by the smoke and by the brimstone which issued out of their mouths. In other words, if we go back and see those previously that died as a result of the, of the seal judgments. What this means is, my friends, a quarter and a third of the population of earth means that at this time at least one half of all the population of the entire world has been killed or they have died. Now that's how bad it's going to be. And again, during all this time, and we have some of the background given us here in the next few chapters about other things that the world will be facing at this time. The Antichrist will be coming on the scene and the false prophet, they'll be demanding that you either take a mark of allegiance to him uh, and, and worship him, abomination, desolation, all that, mid part of tribulation, or you will die. Because the Bible says you won't be able to buy, sell, or trade during this time unless, unless you take the mark of the beast. And then if you take the mark of the beast, you know what happens? You seal your own destiny, my friends. And the Bible says in chapter 14, I believe it is, for those who take the mark of the beast. Look at that, if you would, chapter 14. Verses 9. If the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead, this is the mark of the beast, or in his hand, the same shall drink 
of the wine of the wrath of God, undiluted wrath, pure wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of that torment ascended up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Now listen to me. I'm going back and reviewing all of this kind of way review to show you exactly where we are before we come to this last series of judgments. It can help you appreciate a little bit better the words of Daniel in the Old Testament, never been a time like this, and the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. And when he's saying these words to his disciples, man, all of it, this chord, that going on there you know that of course what he is doing I believe by this he's given a warning not only to them and the readers then and the hearers then that is but he's given to us as well in the day in which we'll be there. he is saying simply this you don't want to be here for this it's going to be an awful time never has there been a, any more time of suffering and there never will be another time that will equal exactly what the world is going to go, go through at this time So if there was ever a time that we need to be praying for the lost, we ought to be doing it right now. If there was ever a time that we ought to be witnessing to the lost, to our friends, to our families, to our neighbors, and pleading with them to get their hearts right and and to flee from the wrath to come, it ought to be right now. Because I'm telling you, my friends, the wrath is about to come. This old world cannot continue as it's going right now. You can see it, I can see it. If you've got any common sense, you can see it right now. The world is in a collapsed mode right now. And there's no telling what we're going to see in the days ahead. But what I think here is, according to the signs that I read in the Word of God, all the scriptures that I read, God is just getting ready to send His Son, Jesus, to get to church. And when the church is taken out of here, listen, then all these judgments begin. And if you have... If you, up until this time, up until the trumpet sounds and the rapture takes place, if you've had an opportunity, listen, to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, and the Spirit of God has moved on your heart at any time, and you have said no, no, no up to that time. Personally, I believe, from the scriptures I read, you will not have another opportunity to do that. You might say, well, you just told me a few minutes ago, Pastor, that there's going to be multitudes saved during the tribulation uh, but through, the, uh, through the preaching of the 144,000, the two witnesses such as that, and other means that God will use to bring souls. Yes, I believe that. But I believe it will be those, my friends, who have never heard or understood or been convicted of their need for the Savior of the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe the rest of the world, especially those that said no to Christ, refused the mercy of God, trampled underfoot the shed blood of the Son of God by refusing to receive Christ. During the church age, their grace in which we in. Now, I believe they'll come under this strong delusion. And they'll be so hardened. We talked about this last week. They'll be so hardened, so calloused, that the Spirit of God will not even be able to penetrate their heart. They might hear it, but it'll mean nothing to them. And they'll be so hard, so callous up to this time. Do you see the suffering that the world has already gone through? And now we'll get, come up to the last part of the tribulation. This is the very last part because this comes right before the second coming Amen. of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not the rapture. Rapture's already taken place. Saints of God, the church is in heaven with Him. When Jesus comes back, they'll be with Him when He comes back. That you, thank God we won't have to do anything. We just watch Jesus do it all, right? That's going to happen, right? But these things happen, uh, you know, one after another, one judgment after another. And the gates of heaven have been closed at this time. God has closed. God has said no more mercy, no more grace. Why? Because, again, they send away their day of grace. Now look at chapter 16, verse 15, chapter 15, verse 1 says this, before we get to 16. Listen to what John says. I saw another, angel, another sign that is in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having their seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. 
In other words, this is an announcement. This is saying right here that this is the final outpouring. What's going to happen now is the final outpouring of the wrath of God. When we say wrath of God, we mean a holy anger that God has against sin and a sin-loving uh, world at this time. And this is going to bring to a conclusion. This is going to be the end, okay? This is going to be the end. Woe be unto those who will be, still be alive when these events begin to take place. Chapter 16 now. Chapter 16, verse 1. Look at that if you would. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials. These are word vials is a word actually for bowl or saucer, which means that it doesn't come out as a drip, as a little bit. It can be poured out like this. So the vials are the wrath of God upon the earth. And the first went, the first angel goes. Now listen to this, in obedience to the command of God himself, this is from God himself, from the altar. First went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast. That's those who were left who took the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. Notice again, those who are alive who have not received the mark of the beast, and it's going to be a few at this time, right? Those poor, brave souls are not going to take the mark of the beast. They'll be running for their life. The ones that hadn't been, you know, martyred for their faith, they'll be in hiding probably, just trying to exist, trying to survive, survive until this time. But they will be exempt from this. It's clearly here saying that this is judgment only for those who receive the mark of the beast. Just like the Israelites were spared, you know, during the judgment, during the plagues, you know, as God was delivering the Israelites from Egypt. The Israelites were spared from all of those terrible judgments that the Egyptians were going through. At this time, those who refused the mark of the beast, they're not going to see this, this judgment here. But it says, A grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast. Now listen to this. It is uh, it, 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 it's, it's from God himself. These sores, they're noisome and grievous, which means they are festering, painful, uncurable, malignant sores. That, that, and the word actually means it's an ulcer of some kind of malignant skin disease. It's been described, described by some as probably the worst thing that anyone has ever experienced by mankind. Far worse than cancer, far worse than a leprosy. Not only loathsome and sickening in sight, but also very, very painful these sores are. Because you can look at verses 10 and 11 of this same chapter. And it says, The fifth angel poured out his vial upon the sea as a beast, and the kingdom was full of darkness. And no notice what it says. They gnaw gnawed their tongues in pain. They're in severe agony. And blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and they repented not of their deeds. What are the sores and the pain coming from? This is coming from these, this plague of sores that's already been upon them as a result of this first bold judgment. So it's, it's, a, it's, uh, it's a loathsome and sickening sight, but it's also very, very painful. Now we get to uh, the second one. Look, if you would, at uh, verse 3. The Bible says, And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man, and every living soul died in the sea. Now you go back to the trumpet judgment, and you see a similar judgment. But you see uh, different results, right? Only a third of the creatures in the sea died in, this, uh, in, the, in that trumpet judgment. But here, what does it say? It says that every living creature dies in the sea. Isn't that an awful thought, thought, thought there? In other words, the oceans become a pool of death. The sea becomes as the blood of a dead man. Not sure there's actual blood, but it could, could be, couldn't it? Because Christ turned the water into one. God can do whatever he wants to do. Don't know exactly what it means, but it's going to have appearance of blood. So as a result of this, every living creature in the seas died. Again, can you think, my friends, of the decay and the, and the disease and the stench and the sickening sights and the sounds and the smells of those days? And again, not one-third, but universal. Every sea creature dies as a result of this. Now we can see in the third bowl, blood follows bowl. Third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and the drinking water, the fresh water supply, and the fountains of waters. They became blood. They became blood. 
So the third bowl judgment, again, my friends, not only a third, but all the population is going to be affected by this. No drinking water. No drinking water. None whatsoever. And water is a necessity of life. But no drinking water. Can you imagine someone said that's going to be a run to the grocery stores for bottled water, for cans of Pepsi? Where's laying at? Pepsi, Coke, such things as that. But that won't last long, will it? It will not last long. But that's going to be a result of this third bowl judgment. It's going to be a horrible time. Now, why is all of this happening? Look at this, what it says in verse 5. I heard the angel of the water say, Thou art righteous, O Lord. Thou art right. You're right in doing this, Lord. Jehovah God, Jesus, you have every right to do this. The world is going to be fussing and fuming and fighting and cursing God to his face, blaspheming and saying, this is so unfair, this is cruel, you shouldn't be doing this. But the angel says, God, you're right. You're right to do this. Why? Because it says, You're righteous, O Lord, which art, was, and shall be, because you have judged this. You are doing this, and you're right in doing this. Why? Because the reason is given. They have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and now you have given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. And he goes on to say in verse 7, too, I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. The world at this time, and you might not agree with this, you might say this is cruel, this is barbaric, God couldn't do anything like this. The blessed Lord Jesus couldn't do anything like this. But my friends, as we said a few minutes ago, the world would be deserving of this because God has gone out of His way. The sovereign God, Creator Almighty God has done all He could to get His people to come to Him. And in mercy and love, extended grace. Listen, because, and look at what he's done through his son, Jesus Christ. God's going to have every right in the world to do this. The world will be, and up to this time, they are killing the people. They are slaying the prophets, the preachers, those who are trying. Listen, they've already killed the two witnesses at this time. You remember that? They killed the two witnesses who are preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the world celebrates, the world celebrates. It's like Christmas, they exchange gifts because the two witnesses have been slain. Listen. And so, rightly so, the world's getting just what they deserve. And you would say the same thing. So, that's the third bowl judgment. Then the fourth bowl judgment. Look at this, verse 8. The fourth angel poured out his vow, his bowl, upon the sun. And this is done to the sun. Listen to this. And power was given to him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat. And do they turn to God? Do they turn to God? Look at all the suffering they've been going through. Look at all the torment. Look at all the agony. Look at all of the pain they're enduring. You would think in a sense that if they know this is from God, at this time they'd be falling out on their faces and knees and crying out for mercy. But no. Verse 9 says, that they blaspheme the name of God, which hath power over these plagues. And they repented not to give him glory. Glory. I thought about this as I was reading this, and I read what someone else said. You know, we, we hear a lot about deathbed repentance, deathbed conversions. And I have been, I have seen some, many I've seen. But you shouldn't count on that fact that happening. Because usually men and women die just as they have lived. And usually when it comes to the end, if they haven't given their heart to Christ up to that time, they probably never will. Do you see any deathbed repentance out of this? I don't see a bit, do you? And I see the opposite. I see that they're, they're, they're railing on God, blasphemy means. And they're cursing God. And they're saying, you have no right to do this to me. I don't deserve this. They're cursing God. And they're, repent they're not repenting. So we see that this, this fourth bowl... It is a sun-induced heat wave, my friends, like we have never witnessed before. In the trumpet judgments, you know, the sun was diminished, and it shone not for a third part of the day. But here, God turns up the heat, doesn't he? And it's a sun-induced heat wave, and hotter than mankind has ever, ever, ever witnessed. And you know what? I believe, and I, read, I wrote this down many years ago. 
previous message I preached on this. We could be nearing a time like this because how the climate, we hear this every day, now, you know, global warming, climate change and all this. The, the world is warmer today by a few degrees than it's ever been uh, before and it seems like it's getting that way to us, don't it? Seems like it's hotter than it's ever been. I know they'll say the temperatures, you know, you had not setting any records or anything like that. But it's something about the heat that's different to me. Or is I'm just getting old? I don't know. But I know this. I wrote this. Down. World Watch Institute wrote this down and uh, said this years ago. The ozone layer in the upper atmosphere that protects us from ultraviolet radiation is thinning. The temperature of the earth appears to be rising. I wrote this about 20 years ago, folks. It appears to be rising, posing a threat of unknown dimensions, dimensions to today. Uh, and, and, and also, again, you see everything that they're going through at this time because of seal and trumpet judgments. Oh, there's no telling what people are going to feel during this day. But it is a difference today. I remember I asked my grandmother years ago. Bless her heart, she's with the Lord now. She died when she was 99 years old. I asked, I said, I said, granted, does it seem harder today than it's ever been before? I mean, you've been around here, you know, since Noah, I think. I said something like that. Or Moses. She said, yes, it is. It does seem harder today than it's ever been before. But I think it's because the ozone layers. And also, you've got to remember, too, by this time, when this happens, we know that the ozone layer has been affected some more. And the atmosphere has been changed because of these other judgments, which could contain a nuclear holocaust, atomic bombs, all of these things going on. So definitely the atmosphere to protect mankind up to this time has thinned, and the ozone layer is thin. So you can imagine that as a result of this, the suffering is unheard of, the scorching heat, the sun strokes, the heat strokes, the heart attacks, unbearable, unbearable pain from the malignant skin cancers and, and more and more skin, skin disease and skin cancers. And on top of all that, no repentance. No turning to God. The fifth bowl, verse 10. The fifth bowl, fifth angel, that is, poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast and his kingdom, the seat of the beast, the throne, literally the throne of the Antichrist. His kingdom was full of dark. This affects his kingdom. Now, where is his kingdom located at? All around the world at this time. Right. All around the world at this time. Because all the world, remember, followed after the beast. And who can make war with the beast? Daniel said. So all the world is following out the beast. They're worshiping him. But when the lights are turned out by Almighty God, listen, it falls upon all the world. And the Bible says they gnaw their tongues for pain, which means they are in severe agony at this time. Darkness seems to intensify the pain and the suffering that they're going through. I don't know if you, if you ever noticed that sometimes when you're hurting or when you're sick or maybe something else is going on, and at night when it's dark, when the lights are out, it seems like that intensifies, if you will, the suffering that you're going through. Well, the whole world is going to be going through this period of darkness at this time as God has turned out the lights. The suffering is intensified and it's, it's more severe. But do they turn back to God? No, verse 11. This is the last time it says this. They blaspheme the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and they repented not of their deeds. No repentance. No turning back to God. No asking God for forgiveness and for mercy, for love. Listen, none whatsoever. Man, it's just, it's just too late. It's just too late. The sixth bowl. I just hit on that briefly because I want to look at this next time. We'll talk about the battle of Armageddon next time. The sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates. This great river that separates the east from the west, which formed the east and western boundary of the people of Israel, I believe it is. It's 1,800 miles long. This is associated back with the trumpet judgments where I believe it was a trumpet judgment or it could have been a seal judgment where the way is being made preparation for the kings of the east, this 200 million man army. So this is an associate with it. And someone says, well, this kind of isn't like overlapping. 
No, it's not overlapping. It's just these things are happening so fast like this. You could just one after another. So the way the water, the water of the Euphrates is dried up so that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And then he says this, verse 13. I saw three unclean spirits, demonic spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. These are demonic creatures that God allows to be used by Satan, by the Antichrist, by the false prophet, the unholy trinity here. And they're going to be released for one purpose. They're the spirits of demons, devils, working miracles, which goes forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Verse 15 says this. Some theologian says this is just a word to those few poor pitiful Christians that's holding out. Okay? Some have even said, though it might be one more invitation that God gives. Look at what it says, verse 15. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth, keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. And then it goes on to say, to the reason of the spirits, what God is doing, he's gathering all the armies of the world to this one geographical place in the world to do battle against the Antichrist, but eventually it'll be turned to the Christ. And you know what happens when that happens, right? So all of this, my friends, is, I will close by simply saying this. Do y'all understand this? And this is what we need to remind ourselves of. That we just don't know when the rapture is going to happen. We just don't know when Jesus is going to come for the church. We, we believe in an imminent coming of Christ for the church. Which simply means that he could come at any time, at any hour, at any day. He could come before we get in our cars, my friends, in this parking lot and leave. But when he comes and it takes the church out of here, then this period of time begins. And you all understand when these events start to happen and take place, it is just like when God closed. God himself did it. Remember when the ark, Noah, when all his family got into the ark? Who closed that door? God, did. God closed that door. He closed that door. And then the rains came and the floods came, right? God closed that door. God is about, I believe, about to close the door of the ark again. And when he does that, when the church is taken out of here, taken, and it could happen at any time, it's going to be too late. I hope and pray, if you're sitting here this morning, listen, that you are ready, that you know Christ, that you know that you're saved, that you know that you're born again. You can remember a time in your life. You might not know the exact time, but you know when you bowed your knees, when you asked Jesus to save you. You ask Christ to come in your heart. You ask him to come in your life. You gave your heart to Christ. I, I'm hoping and praying that everyone here has done that at some time in your life. But if you haven't done it, why don't you do it today? One day, we're one heartbeat away from eternity anyway. Y'all realize that? This old heart can stop at any time. And when that, when that last beat takes place, my friends, you're going somewhere to live forever. Amen. If you know Christ, you're going to be with him. If you do not know him, you're going to the other place called Hades, hell. So give your hearts to Christ. Be ready for this. It's going to happen, folks. As sure as you're standing here, these things are going to happen. These are going to happen. If you never trusted Christ, why don't you do it today? Why don't you give your heart? You can do it right where you're sitting at. We can have an invitation in a moment. I'll be right up here in the front. I don't come up here just stand for you to look at me. I'm here in case somebody wants me to pray with them. Might be someone here needs this pastor. By me coming, taking your hand, I want you to pray. I'm receiving Jesus right now. Praise God. And I wouldn't embarrass you. We'd never do that around here. But that's why I'm here. That's why, we're here. That's why this altar is here. For you to make things right with God, my friends. You to make things right with God. And you might be a believer here. You might say, I know Christ. I, I can remember when I got saved. I can definitely remember. But my life right now is not showing it. I need to get my heart right with God. I need to repent. I need to, some things in my life I need to put out of my life. This is serious business, preacher. And I know that when I leave, I'm going to stand before Christ. And I don't want to stand before Him empty-handed. I want to get my heart right now, right with Him. And I want to start again. And I want to make a difference in my life for the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's stand with our heads bowed, eyes closed.